Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, we're gonna bounce around my neighborhood and see what is looking good here at the beginning of January. Probably walk over to NC State campus uh, toward the end of it. Uh, I'm gonna start at uh, one of my uh, friend's gardens here who has a giant camellia collection. We've actually done a few videos over here uh, over time. This is, uh, the camellia japonicas are a little early this year and it's um, almost all of his have some open flowers on them, which is kind of kind of wild right here at the beginning of January. What these require is a little bit of cool weather and then followed by some lengthy period of time of warm weather to start to uh, swell these buds and get them to uh, open. Don't know what variety uh, this one is, but this is a, uh, there are lots of these variegated uh, type flowers. Obviously this one is a, you know, is a pink and white. Every one of these flowers will vary uh, in some way. It's got all the exposed flower parts out in the middle. So I imagine during the uh, middle of the day, there's some, uh, uh, there's some uh, honeybees on them. If the honeybees are active on that particular day, uh, this one is absolutely gorgeous. And what you'll see on this is you've got that open flower, and then up here a little higher, we have a spent bloom from frost or whatever, and then tighter buds, ones that are closer to opening, uh, and then you know flowers that are just starting to open. So there's kind of a wide wide variety there, so it can bloom for a long time. If we happen to dip down and get some real cold won't hurt it at all. You just lose the open flowers that are on it. Uh, over here to the right of that, I can tell that's Professor Sargent. There's a Professor Sargent on my morning walk with the dogs. It's absolutely loaded, solid red. Uh, I'll get a photo of it before I uh, put this video up. This one's in a little bit, a little bit too much shade, I think, uh, and it doesn't have quite as many uh, flowers on it uh, at this point. It's a delicate balance. These are definitely part shade evergreen plants, but he's got these three giant oaks out here in the garden. And uh, they definitely almost, almost to the point of too much shade on these camellias. So let's jump around. Here's a plant I absolutely love in the wintertime. I actually love it all the time, but we have one in a container. Uh, this one is in the ground. This is a color guard yucca. These things are incredibly cold hardy. So you think you wouldn't be, doesn't look like something that would grow in a cold area, but most everybody watching this video can actually grow this plant. Uh, he's got it up on a slight mound here, so it's probably a little drier in the winter, uh, which I'm sure is helpful. These will get flower spikes on them, but it doesn't need to. It has these beautiful yellow streaks. This one is in the uh, Southern Living Plant Collection. This is an interesting screen on a very busy road in the neighborhood. They have this row of dwarf Burford hollies or needlepoint hollies. You could use either one to produce this basically box. So there's three of these planted. There's three planted, then a little gem magnolia, then three planted, then a little gem magnolia, and then back and forth, and there's a gap in between each one. So you, there's a gap in between the solid row of shrubs, but behind it is another screen, basically, and, and a little bit of room for that little gem magnolia. So they'll get the white fragrant flowers on the little gem magnolias. They're, they grow narrow, but they still get quite big, as you can see right here, and you can keep these Dwarf Burford and Needlepoint Hollies, whatever size and shape you want to keep them. I walk past this beautiful Camellia japonica uh, almost every day. It's just absolutely loaded with buds. I don't know how long this one's been there. It's actually been limbed up over time into a small tree. But you can see these flowers, and this is not unusual. Some of these flowers will start off kind of a redder color uh, earlier, in this, earlier in the season. And then as we get cooler nights, the buds that are opening on nights that are 30 degrees or you know cooler uh, slight freezes or just above freezing will open kind of a, with a little bit of a purple hue to them so again i don't know what variety this is because there's hundreds of named varieties of, of of camellia japonicas but this one is just always spectacular and it sits next to a hedge of loripetalum and these loripetalum have just been maintained as basically a wall. You know, this is the kind of screening you do on an urban lot that's, you know, these, these, these lots are, you know, less than a quarter of an acre. And so how, how do you create little screens and blocks and private spaces on a very busy street? You know, you have to find plants that you can hedge like this. So this has been done with, an, with abelia, camellia japonicas, uh, yeah, abelia, camellia japonicas, and loripetalum. Another thing about having shrubs out by the road like this is in a in a really busy place with a sidewalk like this definitely dogs are going to be urinating on these plants and so some of them they have to be salt tolerant plants these are shindo viburnum which can get 40 feet tall probably uh, but upright and narrow these were planted last year 
and they shot up really quick and they flat topped them recently. You can kind of do whatever you want to do with these. It'll be interesting though over time if he actually tries to keep them at this exact height, how they'll look in 10 years. I think he's going to have to let them come up a bit more than this or they're starting to look strange over time. But great shiny foliage. A lot of times when I'm doing consultation work, I say pick the spot that you really, really, really want to screen and that's where your Shindo viburnum goes <laughs> because it's super fast growing, super thick, regenerates really easily if something was to happen to it. Just a great shiny foliage year round screening plant. This was an installation that was done last year with some Eastern Arbor Vita and they weren't really maintained all that well after they were planted, but I wanted, I definitely wanted to show off these Eastern Arbor Vita are not salt tolerant. So every dog that's come and lifted its legs on the bottom of these, you can see the very bottom of each one of them has, uh, has died back from that. Uh, so do be careful with that. These aren't the most heat tolerant uh, Arbor Vita either. So, you know, that's another thing out here by this road. We're kind of in this very southern end of where these would want to be anyway. So we want to think about, you know, really tough, rugged plants in a situation like this. They were trying to create a border, but they've used plants that are just aren't the toughest thing. They're pretty plants, but they're just not the toughest thing that could kind of take all the dog urine and all the other things that could happen on a college campus neighborhood <laughs> overnight. This is always fun in our area this time of year. Uh, in January is when the rosemary blooms. And these are, you know, salvia, salvia members. So they have that type of, you know, salvia flower. There's really intense blue. Kind of depends on the, you know, when we see, we'll see different shades of blue uh, on these. Of course, this is, you know, culinary rosemary. And when it's actively growing uh, during the season, it's, you know, great to cut it. This time of year, it's probably not all that probably not all that great as a culinary item, but when they're the newer growth, the fresher growth, but in the winter time, we get these wonderful flowers on them. Uh, not a whole lot here to take advantage of them right now, uh, but I imagine the bees do uh, when they're out and active. Came across these Silver King Euonymus, which, you know, I, has a beautiful variegation. These are in everything in this neighborhood is basically in park shade. It's a giant um, oak forest, basically, uh, with open spaces in between. If you see this kind of green growth on any of your gold or variegated plants, you'll want to get that out pretty quickly. This is definitely going to grow much faster than this is, and it'll take the plant over very, very quickly. But this is uh, Silver King Euonymus. This is the uh, Raleigh Rose Garden. We're lucky enough to be able to call the Raleigh Rose Garden part of the neighborhood. Uh, the white that you see back here is uh, white cloud mully grass. And boy, does it show off uh, during the winter time. It's just incredible. It's moving around in a light breeze today. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. The grass looks great too earlier in the, se or earlier in the summer. And then in the fall, the starts. And it was already looking pretty good before we left to go out of town three months ago. And so it's still, I, I mean, I would call this kind of peak color at this point. There's some red twig dogwoods in here. Red twig dogwoods typically don't show this much color uh, in our area. We, we're a little warm for them and they tend to not be this red. So they're very striking, you know, get with the white molly grass uh, in the background behind them. And of course, because it's so warm right now, one of the cherry trees is starting to bloom uh, back here behind me. But this is the Riley Little Theater and the Raleigh Rose Garden um, that are you know, part of, part of the neighborhood here. And it's a beautiful place to come and see an incredible collection of roses out here too. You got the dormant Bermuda grass uh, growing out here. Uh, and the roses have been cut back once. They'll cut them back the rest of the way to the ground, I would imagine, probably in February is when they'll come and do that. But there's the odd, <laughs> there's growth on these things now, uh, right here in January. This is a really fun thing we have in the neighborhood, and I've not met the person who's actually in charge of this bee garden here. Uh, I think this is, there's a church across the street from it. I think this is their property, and they're letting them use this to create this incredible bee habitat. There's a ton of native plants. There's, a few, there's some non-natives in here too, but it's majority. Um, there's <laughs> butterfly bush isn't native right beside me, uh, but behind it, uh, there's a smooth hydrangea and an oak leaf hydrangea and so on and so forth. Just tons of native plants in here for the bees. There's actually a bee box in here. There's a lot to learn. I think kids could come in, you know, you could, parents can bring kids in here and really learn a lot about a lot of our native plants and, you know, the, and, and see all the bees that are here, native and non-native uh, bees uh, as well. 
this was a you know during covid this was like a small project steph and i would walk over here you know once a week and see it and it was mostly just plants and over time the sidewalks have been developed uh, structures have been put in steps steps have been put in a whole back garden space back there of course it's dormant right now it's in january most of these uh, perennial things have died back to the ground but i really love coming here uh, it's a really nice uh a really nice space uh, and we can see a lot of the things that we can use in our garden here uh, to attract pollinators we made it over to nc state's campus uh, this is the strolling professor's garden is what we've always called it because back here there's a statue of a strolling a strolling professor uh, this is a, a dwarf uh, camellia i think i'm pretty sure this is shishi gasheri we have the white shishi at the house which has a fuller double white flower that bobby green did that's part of the southern living plant collection funny thing about this one is that bobby has one in his garden at his house and if you've seen the video i did with him it, it's probably 15 to 18 feet tall but we've always called this a dwarf one and it can be kept small and its initial growth habit you can see is kind of flat uh, and wide like this but this is a camellia sasanqua these typically are the fall blooming ones but we're getting a complete overlap this year between the fall and spring blooming ones because of the uh, warmer weather most of the witch hazel family blooms in the early spring so you have father gilla you have distillium laura Patalum, but usually witch hazel itself beats everything else to the punch the hamameliaceae is the family uh, that the witch hazel family but this year because it's warmed up just a little the laura Petalum have actually beat the witch, witch hazels to it and so they have that same kind of frilly flower all those plants i just named the father gilla the distillium you know they all have this uh, rhodolea rhodolea i think is in this family as well um, they all have this kind of frilly uh, flower on them this is of course a green foliage laura petalum it's got a little bit of purple in the new growth but it's mostly just a green variety with those pinkish flowers on it and it's just getting started i would imagine what's going to happen is we're going to get a night cold enough to knock these flowers back and then it'll stop the rest of the buds from opening but once it does it'll be basically solid pink for a week or two even the quints have started blooming already usually it's a little later in usually february here in our area unfortunately these have kind of been eaten up with some english ivy from underneath uh, there's a, uh, a black cherry growing up in here some sort of um, holly that's come up from seed uh, liriope underneath it this is kind of a, a, a crazy crazy little spot here uh, quince has never been overall one of my favorites i love quince jelly <laughs> um, but usually the plants are you know kind of uh uh, can get a little out of control and kind of colonize like this one has over some period of time. I always like them initially uh, and then, you know, when they're one shrub and then after you cut them a few times, after they grow for a while, they can be, they can kind of be prepared for them to take over a space uh, in time and honestly take a little bit of a dive down in the amount of flowers you get each year. But these, these are just getting started. There'll be tons of flowers on them and there's like there's a lot of varieties of them one thing that's really interesting back here is the fatsia is still blooming so our fatsia bloomed a month and a half ago something like that uh, it finished pretty quick this one you can see has been blooming for a long time and it has open flowers on it today any day that's above 60 degrees out here middle of the day the bees absolutely will be swarming these flowers these alien looking uh, flower clusters these umbels um, you know again as they open up it's really complex little flowers make up that umbel or you know you know round ball of flowers but the bees absolutely go crazy for them we're right in front of the horticulture building on the nc state campus and when steph was an undergrad here at nc state she had a job of labeling all the plants that were around the front of this building uh, those labels have you know they disappear over some period of time i wish i wish by law that every camellia that went in the ground and steph actually said this i'll give her credit for this every camellia that goes in the ground by law should have a label on it it has to be permanently labeled so other people that come along later will know what they are this tree is one of my favorite trees on campus this is cornus moss or a cornelian cherry uh, these are actually yellow flowering uh, dogwoods uh, and they bloom pretty early and they're actually budded up here almost too early but typically sometime in february uh, you know we can come over here and look at this thing in full bloom and it's just unbelievable unbelievable it also even without the leaves and without the flowers has beautiful bark on it 
beautiful exfoliating bark that kind of uncovers a bit of a kind of a reddish tone, a tone, orangey tone that's underneath it. One of, again, one of my absolute favorites here on campus. I'm gonna wrap this neighborhood tour edition up uh, with a couple things in a garden that I actually used to maintain. I uh, did some installation here with another uh, landscaper and then when I was out on my own, I did some maintenance here as well. I've known these, knew these folks for a long, long time. Uh, there's some prickly pear cactus uh, out by uh, the road that's been here for a long time and the bottom at the base of it's just so incredibly thick. I've said for a long time, I think, that after everything else has gone on the planet, you know, people think cockroaches will be the last thing. I think it will be prickly pear cactus because I have seen these things in all corners of, of the globe. And it's absolutely amazing how hardy they actually are and the places that they will that they can grow in. A uh, little bit early on the Prunus mume. This is one of my absolute favorite trees uh, in the neighborhood as just a perf absolutely perfect form. Prunus mumes can be a little short-lived this one's been here a long time and it's in great shape. It's starting to open a few flowers. Prunus mume is typically one of the earlier flowering cherries. Uh, and we're probably a week or two away from this thing just being a showstopper, an absolute showstopper. And then all the flowers will drop off, the off of it onto the ground and the ground will be entirely this pinkish red color uh, for a couple of weeks. But Prunus mume. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Let me know down below if you enjoyed this uh, neighborhood walk around edition tour uh, for the channel because we have luckily here because NC State's campus is right next to us and there, there's a horticulture school right there. There's a lot of great gardens uh, in this neighborhood to walk around and take a look at. Thanks for watching.